evening after dinner, I sat with my parents at the red for my table in the kitchen of my family's little home in Compton, California. The year was 1962. It was the spring, and I was just shy of my 18th birthday. My father said, Mark, are you sure you want to go to the University of Reynolds? That's an expensive school. A scholarship will only pay for half the tuition. You could go to Pepperdine University, all expenses paid, and that would save us a lot of money. <laughs> sure it would, my mother said, but Pepperdine still has that segregated student housing. We're not putting any child of ours in that gym for nonsense. So it was decided. I was going to the University of Reading small liberal arts college with only 1,200 students, and it was just 60 miles from my home. A few months later, I was at the University of Redlands, sitting across the desk from the Dean of Women. She was a middle-aged, not <coughs> unattractive woman, dark hair pulled into a bun at the nape of her neck. She looked down at my file and said, well, you are a lucky young woman to have been accepted at this school. You know we have very high standards. I see you went to public schools. And your SAT schools, well, they're just barely adequate. Now being a scholarship student, you will have to maintain a C average in order to stay here. Do you think you can do that? <laughs> uh, by now, I had figured out exactly where she was coming from, mm -hmm. and so I mustered up as much confidence as I could, and I said, yes, I'm sure I can do that. But I wasn't ready for what she had to say next. Now, as for your housing, she said, it was rather difficult to find a roommate for you. I had to call the entire freshman class before I could find one person who would want a room with a negress. <gasps> a negress. A negress, <laughs> I thought to myself. Now back in 1962, black people still very proudly called themselves Negroes. But negress? It was as though in that one moment, that woman had rolled back the calendar 100 years, <laughs> stripped me of all that I valued, and put me on the auction block. Uh -huh. I was speechless. With that warm welcome, you can imagine I wasn't excited about meeting my roommate, but Susie McKee was one of the nicest warmest, most vivacious people you could ever want to meet. Our dorm room had matching everything, matching twin beds, matching desks, matching chairs, matching dresses. <laughs> and as we unpacked and got settled, we discussed our backgrounds and our experiences. Susie said, my father is a doctor and my mother is a stay-at-home mom. I said, my mom is a school teacher and my father is a chef. But even though we didn't have a great deal in common, we got along famously, famously. And when Susie found out that we were the same height, same weight, <laughs> born on the same day, in the oh, same oh, month, oh, in the oh, same oh, year, oh, she said, do you think we could be twins? <laughs> In 1962, civil rights, the civil rights movement was well underway. But on that campus, there were many white students who had never met a black student in their lives. They weren't quite sure what to make of this movement with protests and sit-ins and marches. 
there were only 12 black students on campus. So naturally, we became the resident black, resident black experts. Mm -hmm. I would get questions like, why would Negroes want to live in a neighborhood that they weren't wanted? Or, don't you prefer to be with your own kind? Or, this was worse. Well, you're not like other Negroes. You're different. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I belonged to a service we were called the Spurs. And every year, we would put on a fundraising dance called the Spring Flame. On this particular evening, we were planning the spring fling, and we were looking for a thing. One of the girls spoke up and said, I've got it. Let's do a southern thing. Something like, gone with the wind. Don't dress in ball gowns, and then somebody could be the maid. <laughs> Thank you. 